As the theme and the title of this series suggest, knowing the truth of this world and the other world is the biggest obstacle when you first join a religion. For those that read this book already can understand that I've gone through quite a lot of personal experiences in my life. I actually began to have spiritual experiences in 1981, roughly 30 years ago. Generally, people think of ghosts as scary or frightening. Some even get goosebumps just mentioning about them. When I look back over the past 30 years, I think there wasn't a day of not having any contact with the spiritual beings in the other world. Every day, I would have some form of contact with spiritual beings. For me, it is not just contacting them through the method of channeling and doing spiritual messages. I am able to speak with the spiritual beings in my mind. So before going to bed at night or when I wake at dawn, there are many occasions when I have a chance to speak with the spiritual beings. So I am leading rather an unusual kind of lifestyle. When you ask people, do you believe in the other world, the majority will tend to respond, I don't believe in such things. Generally, if you ask people's thought directly, this is how they would respond. If you ask them privately, they may respond differently. However, if you ask them publicly, do you believe in spirits and the other world, many will say, I don't believe in such. There is probably 60 to 70 percent of Japanese with this kind of response. But for someone like me, who has been talking every day with spiritual beings for 30 years, such a question is irrelevant. If I ask something, I would get an answer from a spirit almost immediately in one or two seconds. It's actually faster than using a phone. If I were to use a phone, I would have to dial the number and wait for the other person to answer the phone. However, in the other world, I would be in direct communication just by thinking. Before I reached enlightenment in March 1981, I believed in the other world. Yet, there was a large difference before and after my experiences with the other world. Believing on the surface level in your head and actually having a direct experience is totally different. There is spiritual existence that try to talk to me or give me answers when I send a message in my mind. Spiritual beings in the other world are actually protecting us in this world, have certain feelings, and want to give their opinions or advice. From another perspective, we are being watched by spirits day and night. This is a situation not many people can handle. Basically, it has been designed in a way that we are unable to see spiritual beings so that they won't interfere with our lifestyle. For example, if you are having dinner at home, there will be not too many who could react well by saying, hey, that's my grandfather who passed away sitting there. If you are sitting beside your grandfather who had passed away, you will most likely scream in shock. You might think, did I do something wrong? Should I go to the grave and apologize for something? Of course, this is a natural reaction. However, if you become like me and are used to many different kinds of spirits coming and going, you would just say, oh, is that right? I see. And that would be it. I can say, sorry, I have nothing to do with you, so please go back, without any problem. Common people would say, I don't know if there is such a thing as the other world. I can't see the spiritual beings. I can't hear their voices. But that is why everything works well in this world. 
People may think if God or Buddha wanted us to be aware of the other world through religion, isn't it better for us to see the other world from the beginning? But if the other world becomes clearly evident, it would be hard for us to engage in our soul training while living in this world. Not only that, it would be a problem for the spirits in the other world as well. If the other world were directly able to interfere and communicate with the people in this world, then the spirits would become attached to this world. The spirits would be like poking at tortoise with sticks saying, do this do that to the people in this world. Then the people of this world will lose their ability to judge situations independently and with their own responsibility. Because of this reason, the spiritual beings are able to offer indirect inspiration to the people in this world, but not able to directly communicate in order for the people to be responsible for their own thinking and action. I touched on this a little in my book, Spare World 101. For example, at a driving school, the instructor sits alongside the student. The instructor watches the students driving very carefully. If the situation suddenly becomes dangerous, the instructor will take over the steering wheel and hit the emergency brakes. Apart from such circumstances, the student is allowed to drive independently. In the same way, the spirits of the other world allow the human beings of this world to take responsibility for what they are doing to a certain extent and they only intervene in dangerous situations. It's an old example, but in ancient times, the Greek philosopher Socrates was said to have a guardian spirit called Daimon. Socrates was able to hear the voice of his guardian spirit. That guardian spirit was a bit unusual in that he never said, do this. He only said, don't do this. Apart from that, he would let Socrates do as he pleased. This is kind of a symbolic example outlining how much the spirits can intervene from the other world to this world. Basically, in regard to living in this world, a person should be allowed to do what they want in order for them to be responsible for their own action. However, as mentioned earlier, like the instructor at the driving school, if it is really necessary at times in danger, the instructor has to step on the brakes. Further, Socrates died from drinking poison hemlock. Apparently, his guardian spirit Daimon didn't say, don't drink the poison, nor did he tell Socrates to run away. His disciples even came to jail to meet him and were about to lead him out. But because his guardian spirit did not say, don't die, Socrates drank the poison from the cup and died. When we only look at this point in time, it seems rather irrational or perhaps feels a little odd. Although the disciples came to help Socrates escape, and the jailer cooperated by pretending not to live, Socrates refused to be helped and just died. It all seems rather absurd. However, Socrates thought the fact that the guardian spirit has said nothing has some meaning. Socrates accepting the situation took a cup of poison and died. Afterward, the meaning of his death gradually became a lot more profound. In other words, Socrates at that time criticized the democratic government of Athens that had fallen into corruption. His death itself was left as an undeniable proof. At the time, he had a disciple named Plato. Plato was a disciple more than 40 years younger than Socrates. When Socrates died, Plato was 28 years old. At first, Plato couldn't understand the meaning of Socrates' death. He contemplated about it over and over. As a result, he came to a conclusion stating that democracy had lost the rule of the hoi polloi. It is necessary to rebuild the political structure. It was time to support the politics of philosophy. Ideal politics based on a philosopher was needed. Here, we can see this example as based on historical facts. All in all, we see that not just religion, but philosophy also has formed, for Socrates was able to hear the voice of his guardian spirit. In most cases, profound philosophies are created by receiving revelations or inspirations from the heavenly world.